Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to my Eurovision React Review channel. And if you're a subscriber or a regular viewer, I hope you are doing well this morning post Eurovision. The post Eurovision blues is what I call it. Um, firstly, let me just acknowledge this. And I'll talk about that a bit later. This is just a quick video. My voice is gone. <laughs> so obviously Saturday night being British, um, I did a lot of shouting and um, I'm gonna be a, a wreck today at work. Um, but I'll talk about a bit about like this in a second. Um, so I'm back in Milano now, I'm back home. So if you're a subscriber or a regular viewer, and if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. You will know obviously for the last week I have been staying in Turin to be able to absorb Eurovision, go to the shows, but I live and work in Milano and I couldn't get the time off work. <laughs> so I've had to travel into Milan every day. And this is why my eyes look like this. I haven't kind of processed the fact Eurovision is over because I've just been processing on how tired I am. <laughs> so yeah, this is gonna be a quick video just to touch base with you guys because obviously um, we now have a winner and we have results and we've had the weekend and I haven't got anything on my channel that has acknowledged that. So it's quite important for me to get this up today. And then this week, I don't know whether there's going to be any want or any need for it. I will do my best to um, do other videos to talk about semi-final results and final results and all of that stuff. But there are some, I think, some poignant things to kind of talk about now and then obviously put it on my channel. So um, this video is obviously going to be bookmarked. There are going to be certain things that people are not going to be interested in because they don't subscribe or don't follow my channel. Um, but I'm just going to start talking about kind of my weekend. So um, on Friday, I was joined by two friends from Milan uh, who are Eurovision fans to a point. So I woke up on Saturday and I had tickets for the family show. Uh, which I didn't know anything about. So obviously you had the jury show on the Friday night, which is when the juries, controversial this year, get to vote. And then the family show. I don't understand the relevance of the family show because like it is kind of a bit amatory because um, like Mika was just in trousers, a jumper and a cap. And like a lot of the artists were just wearing their casual clothes. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, don't like, don't ruin the illusion for me. And I would have been slightly annoyed had I not been next to this little boy. Um, I don't know who he was with. He could have only have been 10. Um, he had some English, he was Italian and he was from Rome. Um, I got that much out of him. And he had his phone and he was trying to follow the songs and he was checking in with me. I was like, yeah, this is this song. And like, I was like, what's your favorites? He's like, Italy and Spain. And it was really cool, like around him. I think we just took him under our wing because like, we're not allowed to stand up, but like anytime an upbeat song came on, he just stood up and we were like, oh yeah, just let him do it. <laughs> and like when the Subwoofer song came on, he was trying to like kind of do the moves. And then, um, Oh, bless, like Armenia was about to come on. Like I was on the side of the stage and I said to him, I was like, this is one of my favorite songs. This is a good song. And then as soon as I saw the stage he come on, like we just couldn't see anything. We just saw the side of the bedroom. And I was like, oh no. I said, oh, I just pointed up to the screen. I was like, look up there. <laughs> I promise it's a good song. And at the end, they were obviously talking about the, like the result, um, the how to phone in and stuff. And he turned around, he tried to speak to me and my basic Italian and his basic English wasn't going anywhere. So he spoke to the Italian guy behind him and I had to ask the Italian guy what he asked. He was like, how do I vote? And he got his phone like to vote and the man behind was like, oh, it's just a rehearsal, you can't vote. I was like, that 10 year old kid was like me when I was 10 and he's been able to come to the arena and watch it live. What a legend. He was such a cool kid. God knows who he was with. <laughs> I may have dreamt it. He might have been like an angel or something, I don't know. Um, but that was just amazing. And what was so nice, um, because I had a long day ahead of me, um, I made the executive decision to stay to watch Maniskin. And I don't know if you've heard this, but Maniskin did not perform because um, DM, DM, I can't remember the lead singer's name now, it's not coming to my head, had hurt himself. And I checked with my friend, I was like, oh my God, you better not have had Maniskin at the jury final because they're not here today. And my friend was like, no, they weren't at the jury final either. So they just had this standing band. And it was kind of awkward because like they finished and they got booed. <laughs> and so someone had to come out and explain what had happened and basically say, please be nice to these guys. <laughs> I was like, oh. Anyway, after that, I was a little bit annoyed by that, actually. So, and, and I just was like, I'm, I'm going to leave because I've got such a long day ahead of me. I don't need to stay and watch anything else. Although I'm kind of a bit annoyed now. I didn't realise Mika was going to do that kind of 
yeah, ensemble thing that he did. Um, anyway, as I was leaving, it was really nice. So obviously I had my Union Jack flag. I was wearing a Union Jack blazer thing. And like people from different countries came to me and said, you're gonna win, you're gonna win. I'm like, oh, don't say that. You're making me nervous now. Um, and then, so what happened there? Yeah, I went home and then I met my friends at a place to grab some food. Like we were planning this to a T. I don't know if anyone knows this, but basically I didn't have tickets for the night. So we were planning to go to the Eurovision Village, which is a big park in Turin. Um, and if you were on Twitter that day, you may have noticed some hysteria around this. It was a absolute show. <laughs> it was shocking. We got there at like quarter past six and I kid you not, it, there were thousands of people congregating near six doors effectively to get in. It was, I mean, it was unsafe. And I, I, I don't like enclosed spaces, but I felt unsafe. And like every time someone tried to leave, people just moved in. It was horrific. Um, and so basically they then closed the doors, but there was no tunnel, so no one knew what was happening. So it got to about seven and I said to my friends, I was like, I can't, I can't physically be in this space. Like I, I feel really unsafe. I need to go. Um, it transpires that they did close the door at six and there were thousands of people outside waiting to go in. Um, and so I just said, let's just go. They did start letting people in slowly. I have I have heard since when we left. And so I'm not going to diss Italy or Torino and about their ability to host Eurovision and embrace Eurovision and give an experience for Eurovision fans that have gone all the way there. There is so much stuff online that basically is adding fuel to that fire. My only question mark is when you leave the Eurovision village and you wanna find somewhere else to watch it, good luck because that was it in regards to the organizers and i've tried to say to people so many times italy and eurovision don't gel like honestly when eurovision when italy won um i like i remember the next day i was talking to italians they're like oh yeah i've heard of eurovision or i've heard of maniskin and since then there's been no general i'm, I'm living in milan the most like cosmopolitan city and like most uh, kind of multicultural city we, we, they, they, they just don't really embrace it like other countries so what was such a shame is trying to walk around turin trying to find a bar with a screen which i'm sure other eurovision fans that have been to other cities have not had that experience um because but also it's just a money maker it seems like a no-brainer like have a screen so we went back to a bar called the huntsman so if you were in turin you'll be aware of the huntsman there were like one or two bars that had events on um, and so we managed to find a table. There was these two lovely Irish girls and they had two seats and we were like, oh, can we sit there? Um, and it was really sweet because Brooke, um, she was amazing. She was there the day before. So Australia, Ireland and the UK fan groups had like a, a, a kind of group session at, at the Huntsman and Brooke went there. And then she was there that day and everyone kept coming to her and saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you deserved it, you were robbed. These two Irish girls properly got fangirl around it. And they were like, oh, we can't go and say like hi to her. I was like, oh, come here. Like, I, I will take you. They could have only been like 18, 19. And they were so excited to get a picture with Brooke. And she was in good form and good spirits. Cause I know a lot of artists, like when they don't qualify from the semifinals, they're on that first plane back. <laughs> but no, she stayed. Um, and it was so awkward because the bar was so busy. I was like, I'm not waiting for this. And moreover, it's so packed. If I just go and get one or two orange juices and just put it in my bag, no one will know. I left my phone with my friends. And so I went to a corner shop, um, this amazing guy he was so sweet. And I got eight orange juices. And <laughs> as I left, I was walking past someone and I did a double take and I was like, Andrea from like North Macedonia. I didn't say Andrea from North Macedonia. She was like, oh, hi. I was like, oh my God, can I have a picture? And she's like, yeah, she was really sweet. Um, and, um, I left my bloody phone with my friends. It was so awkward. I was trying to go through my bag. And I was like, Andre, this is really embarrassing. I don't have my phone, but can I have a hug? <laughs> so I hugged her. I explained, I was like, I left my phone with my friends. I just went and got some drinks at bar. Like, it's just too busy. I can't get a drink. And she was like, it's okay. I hope you get drunk tonight. I was like, oh, thanks, Andrea. And then as I kept walking past, um, obviously I had my Union Jack thing on. 
And it's so annoying because for two days, I'd just be going around to Torino being like, Sam Ryder. Um, because it was an in-joke, because when my friends arrived, like I was trying to get them excited being in a Eurovision city. And there was a, ta- a bar, the table with people with Union Jacks and Irish flags. And I was like, watch this, watch this. This is going to be embarrassing. So I went up to the table being like, Sam Ryder, because I, th- I thought they'll get really excited and that will get my friends excited. They've just arrived in Turin. And um, yeah, that went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> they literally looked at me like I was some sort of freak. It was really awkward and really embarrassing. Um, so that was the in joke. So I was going around be like, Sam Ryder, met Andrea. And then as I was walking past, there was two groups of people that just started singing Spaceman to me. Now I should have gone, I should have returned that with Sam Ryder, but I went blank. Cause I think I was embarrassed about the Andrea thing. So I just turned to them and was like, you know it. Like who says that? What a crappy like response to someone singing your country song. Anyway, get back to the Huntsman. If you were in the Huntsman, because there were hundreds of people in there, and like that's the great thing about this place, obviously. You know, you got your Swedish table, your Finnish table, you've got people standing there with an Azerbaijani flag. Like it was just awesome. If you were there, you will know that there were sound issues in the Huntsman. So you could see it. I must have had 12 or 13 screens in in the proximity of this bar, but you couldn't really hear it. So we had to make an executive decision. Do we go to plan C, go home and watch it and listen to it? Or do we stay? And I said to my friends, I said, look, I was at the family show today. The general feeling is we, we, are gonna do well today. And as a result of that, I don't wanna be in a hotel room as the results come through when we've got a table surrounded by hundreds of people from different countries. We're gonna have to suck up the volume. Luckily, both my friends said to me, because I made them do a preview show and listen to all the songs, they knew them, but they did say it would have been a pretty crappy experience had they sat there not knowing the songs, being like, well, people are cheering for the song, I can't hear it. So we made the executive decision to stay with bad quality sounding, Um, but obviously with the bops, like you didn't need to hear the sound because the whole venue is singing, like. The whole venue sung to Spain, for example. The whole venue sung to Subwoofer. That you didn't need to hear it, um, and it was just, and, and it was just amazing. And I just want to make this point: from that week, going to the shows, speaking to people in bars, like walking past people with flags and stuff. Like I think you understand what I mean by this. I think particularly this year, there's been a lot of toxicity, um, negativity in regards to social media and Eurovision fans. I'm saying this now because from my experience, they are not Eurovision fans. Those that feel the need to go to Twitter to kick off. And I I don't mind someone showing annoyance. I don't mind someone saying, oh, that sun's annoying. Like, but actually like to like have a dig at someone or kind of take it really personal. They're not Eurovision fans. The Eurovision fans were in Torino. I know I'm not saying they are the only Eurovision fans because that night doesn't matter where you're from. Like everyone is just congratulating everyone and committing. Like every time a country had 12 points, you try and find someone with that flag to say, well done. Like it was just an insanely amazing, positive environment. Um, they're Eurovision fans, <laughs> including obviously the millions of people at home uh, who don't feel the need to go to social media to kick off. Um, anyway, um, so you will obviously, like I said, my voice, I cannot tell you as a British Eurovision fan, I don't know that feeling. I said to um, my friends that day, I said, look, historically, I can't remember the last time a jury member has said the United Kingdom. Like, I forgot, I thought, it, I told my friends it was 10 and 12 they announced the the name of the country, the other points just fly in, right? Um, but it was just 12. And I just said, I feel tonight, a, a, a jury member singular is gonna say 12 points. And when that happens, I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> and I was just thinking, right? So that night was an absolute blast. I'm gonna do this because <laughs> I have no idea how next year's gonna go. Um, 
I was just thinking what it must have been like to be a British Eurovision fan going to these host cities over the last 10 years, having to sit there in a bar in the stadium as the results are coming through and just looking around and seeing the Swedish fans cheering, you know, seeing the Dutch fans cheering when points come in. Like, it must be so hard. <laughs> So it was amazing. This was my first Eurovision experience, like being there in the Eurovision city. And I'm just so lucky and blessed that it just happens to be a year that our country's points were being announced. Um, I can't tell you. It, was, it just it started to get a bit awkward because we were obviously doing so well. So people felt the need. Do you know what? In this bar, I think obviously I felt in Torino generally, like the majority of people were Spanish. <laughs> like you couldn't move move for a Spanish flag. And they obviously had made their way to that bar as well. There wasn't lots of people like from the UK and there were like people dotted around because I had 20 of these flags because <laughs> they were like five euros from Amazon. So like I had a few on my table and one or two people like was like, can we have one? I was like, absolutely. So then at one point, obviously I'd had two or three orange juices. I stood up, I was like, if you're from the UK, come and get a hand flag. <laughs> so at some point there were some Union Jacks in this bar. Um, and basically where was i going with that oh it got to the point where obviously we are now doing quite well with the jury votes and people were coming to me being like you're gonna win you're gonna win i was like well don't say that because you'll make me think that's true and there's a dutch lady behind me with a flag she's like oh my god you're gonna win she was like i i can't remember where um duncan lawrence won now she was like i was in that stadium and i know exactly that feeling it's gonna be a great feeling for you i blame her for that kind of semi disappointment where we didn't win but like it was just an amazing night. Now, Sam Ryder. Obviously, the dude is an absolute legend. I did my video of kind of the 10 reasons why I'm so proud of Sam Ryder, and I'll put it up here in kind of complete honor of him. Um, what did Jer uh, Graham Norton say? Um, he did a kind of post. There's a video of them kind of meeting after the results. Um, Sam Ryder and Graham Norton and Graham Norton said to Sam Ryder you are the saviour of Eurovision and I cannot say anything more perfect than that like you know there are so many regardless of what you people outside the UK think about us and British people in regards to our attitudes to Eurovision you would think maybe because we've been sending not great songs that we don't love okay we don't maybe take the contest seriously but we love it like people in the UK, they go through the channels, they see it's on, they keep it on, I promise you. Like Eurovision, like, like viewing figures are anywhere between eight and 11 million. It'd be so interesting to see the views on Saturday night for us doing well. Like if I compare it to France, if you look at France's viewing figures, they're not very high, but in the UK they are high. Like we do like the show. And obviously British people, British kind of non-Eurovision fans, who just tune into the night and love it and say they love it that you could see on Twitter there was a slight disappointment in regards to the, the not the quality of the 26 songs they tune in for craziness they tune in for upbeat camp you know and there were one or two people that when Moldova came on they were like this is what we wanted <laughs> this is Eurovision and there were a few tweets from people back at home being like what's with all the ballads <laughs> um because I made it very clear on my social media to people back at home, being like, if you weren't going to watch tonight, please watch it. I think we're going to do well. You will be very proud. I did try and get, even my nan, bless her. What did she say? Like, my nan is, is messaging on social media now, which is kind of scary. I don't know how it's happening, but I can only imagine it took her like 30 minutes to write this message. Um, if you're a Spanish fan, please do not be offended by this uh, because um, my nan is a lovely person. Don't come for my nan because <laughs> you know how much I love Spain's um, entry. What did she say? She said, stayed up till 12 watching Eurovision. She did this because of me, because she's been following my Eurovision journey. <laughs> um, she says, fair result giving support to Ukraine. Now for my nan to say that, I think that's saying something. I thought she was gonna kick off, but no, she, my, my nan is happy with the result. I like Sweden. Sorry, Shane. Spain gyrating in a thong did not do it for me. Please don't cover my nan. It did everything for me. I love Spain, you know I do. Um, and she says, I haven't watched it for many years. Enjoyed it. Grandad was in bed asleep. <laughs> so like, honestly, I cannot tell you 
this means so much to us in the UK. We won, like in the sense of, I know we didn't win, but on so many other grounds we won. And like, if, number one, like we can now say as British people, or we can't say, or we must refuse to say now, Europe hates us, it's political, we will never do well. Like we can now forget that. I know obviously we killed it with a jury, but like I was so interested in the televote. My phone ran out of battery and I couldn't see or hear the televote. I know we obviously didn't win. Um, so the first thing I did when I got home was charge my phone and be like, what did, how did we do in the televote? And we got 180 something, we came fifth, right? That means so much more to me than, than the jury points. The fact, I think pretty much every other, every country other than maybe a handful of countries gave us points in the televote. That means so much more to me. Um, and thank you for Malta for giving us 12 points in your televote. I really appreciate that. Um, I, met, I messaged Denise from Malta. Um, I want your name, boy. I messaged her saying thank you for the 12 points. <laughs> um, it's just gonna, Honestly, it means so much to us. And I was a bit worried the next day because I was with two people, as I said. One person was like me, happy with the result, had no issue with Ukraine winning. And and we kind of talked about that at length, about the why it's a good thing that Ukraine won. My other friend had some orange juices and basically said, it's political, it's unfair. It seems like when we get Nepal, we lose, it's political. And evidently when we do well, it's political and we're stopped right at the end. Um, and I was like, is this the feeling back at home? I don't know. So I checked Twitter the next day. No, there's no, there was not one tweet saying, what the hell? Like, this is so political. We would have won had it not been X, Y, and Z. Not one British person meshes that. Every British person I could see on Twitter was, give Sam a knighthood. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. What am I watching? So proud. Sam Ryder's a legend. Like, it was just all positive stuff. So I just want to thank every country who was voting, even if you didn't vote for Sam, what this now means back in the UK, because what I must applaud Sam for ever since his name was announced, his country was announced, everything he has done from that moment up until that night on Saturday has been Eurovision. And I was trying to say this to my friends, like if you take Mahmood and I don't want to kind of, you know, pee on Mahmood and Blanco, but from winning San Remo to Saturday, they were pretty much non-existent. They pretty much didn't do much promotion in and around their song, promoting Italy's chances of Eurovision or Eurovision itself. Sam has like lived and breathed Eurovision from, and he's said so many times, his aim this year was never to win. It was to change the mentality of British people and their thoughts for Eurovision, but also change the momentum for the UK at Eurovision. A lot of people are saying this is our a nuke from Netherlands moment, right? This is the start of something. Well, I saw this morning, we've bypassed that. We're now calm after the storm. Like I said, we, we didn't go to a nuke. We've gone further ahead. You know, and, and I'll probably watch this video back next year after next year's Eurovision and be really embarrassed and when we come last again. Um, and I just pray to God that they've got they've got something now. BBC and TAP's relationship. I saw this morning, I need to see if this is fake news, but ESC United did this. They said that actually TAP rejected years and years to get Sam Ryder. Now that's huge because years and years have a huge following in the UK. They are commercially successful. They probably would have sent, well, it's he now, it's just one of them, isn't it? Um, a decent song, but they they took a risk on Sam um so yeah um I, my only concern is i remember when we did well with jade ewan what was that 2009 so the bbc had this kind of idea of getting a songwriter and giving it to them so it was obviously um andrew lloyd webber and then next year they picked pete waterman so i hope they don't take this idea or like go to another production company evidently tap knew what they were doing from the very beginning from selecting the artist selecting the song selecting the staging like and i think the bbc can put their hands up and say yeah we we have historically not done well <laughs> organizing this tap know what they're doing 
Right, I need to go to work in a second. Um, the last thing I'll say is Ukraine. I am so unbelievably happy that you, I'd forgotten, as I was getting so excited with the results, I'd forgotten that for months we've all been saying Ukraine was gonna win. I'd forgotten that Ukraine was number one in the betting odds for so long. It was almost a no brainer. I think all artists must have in their head prepared themselves for the fact that Ukraine were gonna win. Um, Look, at the end of the day, what we were seeing things the next day on social media about how much it meant for people back in Ukraine. Like Stephanie obviously won Vidbeer, but its meaning has changed so much now. It is it is now an anthem for Ukrainians and the defen the defense of their homeland. And for that alone it's significant, but for the fact that you know, I counted it yesterday. What, so it was 39 available countries on the televote. 28 of them gave them 12 points. It's just this kind of solidarity and support for Ukraine. I did say to my friends yesterday, I was like, are we getting to a point where maybe some pe people are being a bit desensitized to what's happening? But evidently not. Like everyone, well, as you could see with the televote, that, 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 that score was huge. This support for Ukraine and what's happening with Ukraine right now. That's symbolic and that means something. I, I, I'm British, I came second. And like, as a result of obviously the conflict, because I think the song is good. I think the song is good. And I always said, if it won, I wouldn't be disappointed because the song is good. I don't think actually, you know, if it's a song contest, I think there may have been some better songs, but regardless, I'm, and I mean, someone said it, it's kind of harrowing but someone said on Twitter, for all of those people that may be kicking off about Ukraine and Ukraine winning, just remember when they go back to Ukraine, because they will, they have, I've seen pictures, they're gonna put on their army suits and go back fighting. So it's not like they're gonna be able to go home and enjoy this like that. Do you know what I mean? Like get some perspective. And you know, if it means for that 24 hours or 48 hours, people in Ukraine or Ukrainians around the world had a moment of, like we, we actually, there were a group of girls with Ukrainian flags, like, and they were on the walkway there. And, you know, I was thinking like, what, what, what's their reaction gonna be in their song as the results come through, if they win? It was just pure elation, just pure happiness. And if for that moment, a Ukrainian can have that with everything that's been going on, then have it. like. And this isn't just being like, like being kind of a bit of a, a nasty person. We're like, we will give it to you. That's never happened. We didn't give it to you. Like the public decided to give it to you. And I just think I was saying to my friends the next day, I was like, had we had won, like had we had won, then, you know, we were fifth in the televote. Like, I can't remember, but my memory's shocking. Can anyone think of another country that's won where they where the jury allowed them to win, right? Yeah, because we weren't, we, so who was in front of us in the televote? Well, Ukraine, obviously, Moldova, Serbia, Spain, is it? Like, you know, there would have been hysteria the next day and negativity about the UK winning, being like, oh, the, only the, it was the juries that got you through. Yeah, so like to save that and to kind of end this on a more positive note, i.e. people in the UK now are so proud about our entry, Fine. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I'm happy with this. And let's kind of watch moving forward what's now going to happen, who's going to host it. I did see, and like, yeah, Twitter went crazy about this, that Turin has said we'd do it again. <laughs> like I said, Italy is my second home. I live here. I'm not going to say whether that's a good or bad thing. Um, but I could I could do with going to another city because I want to do it again because I loved it. Um, look, I have to go now. Like I said, this is just a touch base video and there's so many things that I need to talk about, particularly this jury drama, the semi-final results. So please be patient with me this week. I will post videos and obviously they'll wean out as we kind of get a bit sick and tired of Eurovision and just want to move on with our lives. My job in the next two days is to work out a new playlist. Like I need a post Eurovision playlist that probably isn't Eurovision, um, but yeah. There we go. I'll leave that there. Um, and yeah, I've got so much more things to say and I'll do that this week. And then, like I said, we'll maybe slow these videos down because they'll lose their momentum and purpose. Um, but if you are still here and you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe. Please do click the notification button so you're informed if and when I post videos. And yeah, until next time, stay safe.